Today, our community at the University of Sussex remembers the millions of victims who perished at the hands of the Nazis. We also remember those who are still today subject to the horrific memories of the Holocaust. We honour the memory of those heroes who died fighting the Nazis and saving countless lives. A year ago, we were commemorating the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz at our annual Holocaust Memorial event on campus. And we welcomed students, staff, local schools and our wider community to commemorate the event with us in person. A few months later, just as many museums and memorial sites were preparing for physical gatherings designed to mark further special anniversaries of the end of World War II and the liberation of the last Nazi concentration camps, the COVID-19 pandemic forced them to close their doors to the public. Whilst many of us hoped we would only face restrictions for a few months, we sadly find ourselves commemorating Holocaust Memorial Day online this year. The theme of Holocaust Memorial Day this year is Be the Light in the Darkness. It encourages everyone to reflect on the depths that humanity can sink to, but also the ways that individuals and communities have again and again resisted that darkness to be the light by demonstrating kindness, understanding and tolerance. Our guest speakers, Peter and George Summerfield, are a prime example of the light that shines through despite their circumstances. And we're delighted that they've agreed to share their story with us today. Peter Summerfield has been one of the longest standing members of the advisory board of the Centre for German Jewish Studies and its honorary solicitor. And we're particularly delighted that Peter and his twin brother George, who has also been a supporter of the Centre for many years, will be letting us hear their testimonies from such a dark period. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks once again to the Association of Jewish Refugees for their support. The Association has supported our event since 2001, when Holocaust Memorial Day was first officially marked in the UK's calendar. Sussex was the first university in England to host a memorial event. We are extremely grateful to you for your invaluable and continued support. We believe that it is imperative that young people learn of the atrocities of the Holocaust and we continue to educate society about the dangers of exclusionary institutional structures, prejudice, discrimination and dehumanisation. Whether that's the anti-Semitism that fuelled the Holocaust or other forms of racism and intolerance. This annual event demonstrates our commitment to Holocaust commemoration and education and I would encourage all of you to try to be the light in the darkness in these uncertain times. Thank you. Hello, Sussex University, and all those who are going to be listening to us today as we tell you our stories. We are very honoured and pleased to be able to have this chance. We would much rather be there in person, but unfortunately, times at the moment do not allow this. But let me just introduce both my brother and myself. My name is Peter William Summerfield. It wasn't always that. I was born in 1933, Klaus Peter Willi Sommerfeld. And this is my twin brother, George. My name is George Arthur Summerfield. But it wasn't always George Arthur Summerfield. I was born 25 minutes before my twin brother here, also in Berlin, uh, and I was called Heinz Günther Arthur Sommerfeld. Now, it's very important for everyone to remember Holocaust Memorial Day, and this event is important even now, although it's 75 years after the end of the war. People so often forget the Holocaust or even deny it, but we're here to tell you our story. This isn't just history because we'll be telling you what actually happened to us and to our families. Now the theme of Holocaust Memorial Day is be the light in the darkness. And we will show you that we were very fortunate 
to be able to get out of Germany at the very last moment. Otherwise, we wouldn't be speaking to you here today. When we speak about darkness, we certainly had our fair share of it. But really, if one thinks about darkness, one thinks in terms of what the Nazis did to the Jews, killing six million of them. Now, my brother and I, being twins, could so easily have fallen into the hands of someone like Mengele, who, as you probably most of you know, did terrible experiments on twins. Fortunately, we were able to escape concentration camp, but we did have difficult times as well. Now, the way that we're going to deal with it is this. My brother is going to talk about the time in Berlin before we made our escape. And I will then tell you about how we got out at the very last moment. So it's going to be my brother who starts first by telling you about life in Germany in 1933 onwards after we were born. George. There were primarily two factors uh, that uh, <clears throat> influenced us in 1933. On the one hand, uh, Hitler was uh, came to power and was uh, elected uh, as head of the Nazi movement, and that made an enormous difference to the lives of everyone in Berlin, but particularly those uh, who were Jewish. Uh, from then onwards, life was never the same again until the end of the war. And the problems which uh, Hitler and the Nazis brought uh, first to Berlin and then to the world as a whole made an enormous difference for the following years. But the second point is that 1933 is also the year where my t twin brother Peter and I were born. I was born first and in those days um, parents did not know that uh, either twins or more than one child was being expected. So that uh, first I was born and when Peter then was born 25 minutes later, it came as a complete surprise to my parents. Um, but uh, uh, they got over the shock uh, because there were other problems that they had at the time. Apart from the fact that uh, having four in the family unexpected, um, it, the other problem was that my father, three months before uh, we were born, um, was actually thrown out of his job. He was working in the civil service and uh, three months prior to our birth, he was just thrown out as in fact many of the Jewish uh, men and women were thrown out at that time um, just because they were Jewish. Uh, this meant of course that here was my father all of a sudden with a family of four of us um, and uh, uh, having to cope financially. Luckily, my mother, who was a, uh, uh, a dressmaker, was able to earn some extra money for the work that she was able to do, but it still came as a complete surprise. 1933 was a, a difficult year anyway, uh, because everything in Germany changed with the growth of uh, Nazism, with the um, uh, concentration camps that were opened and with many other factors uh, that influenced what was happening at the time with the growth of Nazism. But uh, most of what Peter and I can remember, and here now, 87 years later, we still remember very well, are a few of the factors that influenced our lives, but at the age of five, because that was a time when we began to understand that things were not normal and were able to take in uh, what was happening. And I'd like to give you some examples of what did happen. One of the first examples that I remember is that uh, we used to go across the road to the local park as children would normally go. And uh, one day we were walked across and found to our surprise that instead of just being able to enjoy the park as we normally did, we found that a very small section of the left-hand side of the park was marked for Jews, where the benches had been colored yellow. The main part 
and the best part of the park on the right hand side had a specific uh, 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 detail saying Jews not allowed and there the benches were green. My brother has said from time to time that this was perhaps done for us to learn the difference between colours but at the time it certainly came as a surprise. The next thing that happened was that friends of ours who uh, were the sons of our caretaker where we lived played with us uh, on a daily basis uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the local area where we stayed. And one day they came home and to our surprise were in tears. So we asked them, why are you crying? And they said, well, in school that morning, the children were asked, do any of you who are Christian play with Jewish children? So they answered, oh, actually we do. We play almost on a daily basis with our Jewish friends, uh, the twins. And they were told, you are never allowed to play with them again. Well, you can imagine how they felt and you can imagine how we felt. We were all in tears. Their father, the caretaker, who was not a Nazi, came to my parents that evening and apologised for what was happening. He was not a Nazi. In fact, he was a friend. And he told us and told my parents at the time that he had no, um, no alternative, that if he didn't agree to what was being said, uh, he would himself be arrested. So from then onwards, we were not allowed to play with our main children anymore. This may only sound trivial, but as children aged five at the time, you can imagine how we felt. Next, it was time for us to go to school. And uh, the only school allowed to us was a Jewish school, which was three quarters of an hour away from where we lived and involved a train journey across to the other side of Berlin. Our mother would take us there. Obviously, at that age, you only had mornings uh, uh, and that would be sufficient. So my mother knew that when she took us, um, she had to wait for three hours. And uh, in the place where we, she was waiting, there was no possibility of doing anything because all that, at that time already, the shops all had notices, Jews not allowed. The uh, one park in that area also uh, was not allowed to anyone Jewish and uh, she was not able to go to any restaurant or uh, cinema. All she could do was walk up and down the street and then bring us back again. And uh, you can imagine that this uh, was uh, something that uh, uh, made life very difficult for her. In October 1938, we were taken for the first time to a service at our synagogue, which was a large synagogue in the Fasanenstrasse one which we um, always saw at some distance whenever we traveled uh, from uh, uh, in towards our school. One month after we had the uh, uh, service at the synagogue, we saw the synagogue actually in flames. Uh, it was the next morning after Kristallnacht and it was still in smoke with flames coming from it. At the time, we learned later, the fire brigade did not do anything to stop the flames, but just waited in case of any problems with the buildings next door. The only other thing we did, which I remember well, was that we were taken to, um, on holiday, uh, to uh, Kölberg, which is on the North Sea. Again, uh, what should have been an enjoyable occasion was rather less so because when we arrived we found that we were only allowed to play and go into the uh, into the water at one small area of the uh, uh, Beach. Of, of, of the city and also that most of the uh, hotels were not uh, made available to us but only three small sh uh, hotels that were allowed to Jews. These were all incidents which one remembers even after these years. Kristallnacht caused um, a great deal of problems for the Jewish people. Some 30,000 Jews were 
captured and sent to concentration camps. Uh, a large number were uh, murdered at the time, and also all the Jewish shops virtually in the whole of Germany were um, burnt and completely taken over by the uh, Nazi stormtroopers. That's all the Jewish ones, yes. All the Jewish ones. Life became more and more difficult, and uh, in the uh, years that followed, uh, my parents decided that if possible, they would like to find a way of getting away. They had no choice but to try and uh, escape. So I now leave the soy next to my brother. Now George has given you some information as to how dreadful life had become. The noose was tightening around the Jews. There was less and less which they could do. And so now, obviously, everyone was talking about how one could get out of Germany. Now, I still remember as well that on Kristallnacht, I remember the fire, I remember seeing it from the, from the train, but what people don't really know is that it's the Germans and Nazis made the Jewish community pay for the damage which the Nazis themselves had caused. I mean, this was adding insult to injury. Kristallnacht, really, was the worst tragedy at that time. It could possibly have been avoided because shortly beforehand there was a conference which the Americans and the British called the Avian Conference. And at that conference there was talk about trying to help Jews to escape. Although they talked for days, the result was minimal. There was not one country prepared to take more Jews or to make life easier for Jews to escape. And this gave Hitler the green light. That's why he could go on and commit the heinous crimes which were committed in Kristallnacht. This was planned. They'd already planned for people to get into concentration camp on that day. As George has mentioned, 30,000. Amongst them, my late father-in-law. Fortunately, his wife was able to extricate him after a while by going to Gestapo headquarters and getting someone to help find the letter which he needed to show that he had permission to come to England. Here was a person who was helpful. He was one of the people who was the light in the darkness. Just as the caretaker was the light in the darkness. Because when it came to Kristallnacht, he allowed my father to hide in the cellar. Otherwise he would have been captured. So there were people who did good. Unfortunately, there weren't enough people who were prepared to risk their own lives to help Jewish people. My parents must have felt awful in those days. As a result of the Nuremberg Laws, we'd even lost our statehood. We were no longer Germans. And these edicts against us, not only were we not allowed to enter restaurants and cinemas and theatres, but they weren't even allowed to go to a gym. My late mother-in-law loved swimming. She wasn't allowed to swim. So everyone was saying, how can we get out? There were two ways in which it was just possible to get out. And that is why more people were able to escape, more Jews were able to escape from Germany than all the other countries which Hitler then later occupies. The two ways were, one was to find someone who would be financially responsible for you, a sponsor. The other was to find a company or someone to give you a job. My parents first tried to get into Australia. Australia needed people at the time. It was almost underpopulated. But that didn't work. There was no one there to help us. And then my parents remembered that there was a distant uncle in eastern Pennsylvania. We wrote to him. His first reaction was, well, I'm already helping two other families. I'm sorry, I don't think I can afford to help you as well. And he wasn't very rich, we know that. Fortunately, in the end, he relented 
and he did give us that permission. This was the good news, because we now heard from the consulate in Berlin that we would be allowed into the United States. But then we had the bad news, because we were number, I've got a letter here, we were number 42,686, 7, 8 and 9 on the waiting list. This letter, which is dated the 16th of December 1938, so nine months before the war started on the 1st of September 1939, so nine months beforehand, that arrived, but we were told, don't contact us, we'll write to you, we'll be in touch with you. So you can imagine, my parents were on tenterhooks. We desperately needed a letter to get away. You won't believe it, but it took nine months before we were finally told in July of 1939, yes, now you can pack your things, you can finally leave. Everything in Germany was getting worse and worse for Jewish people. More and more were being sent into concentration camps. We stopped going to the park, which George mentioned. Why? Because every person had to have an identity card. And if they didn't have a Nazi lapel on their coat or their jacket, people would know you're Jewish. Or you could be asked for your identity card. Here is the original identity card of my mother with a big J on it. And by that time, every woman had to have the name Sarah and every man had to have the name Israel. That's why her name was Margot Sarah Zummerfeld, as it says here. So now we had to pack all our belongings. And we had a very big container, and this container was in one of the three rooms which we then occupied. My parents weren't rich, they were just normal Germans, thinking that they would live their life in Germany. But here we were packing to go to a place we had only heard of, the United States, but which offered us freedom. Into this big container we put all our belongings, our furniture, our clothing, everything we had. And my father had this bright idea of putting a lot of things like crockery and other things in little cases and boxes. And then he closed them up with a key. We had about 25, 26 of those boxes. The container was very carefully watched by a Gestapo officer because there was a definite list of what we were allowed to take and what we were not allowed to take. Only, for example, four sets of knives and forks and spoons. No silver, nothing valuable. We also had to give up all our money. Most of the money we'd already paid in taxes. Every night, while the packing was going on, the room was sealed off. I remember my parents saying, for goodness sake, don't go near that seal, leave it well alone. Because if we'd broken the seal, all of us could have been sent straight into concentration camp. That container went to Hamburg as planned. It was supposed to go by ship direct from Hamburg to New York and then on to Pennsylvania. Do you think we ever saw any of that again? No. As soon as it got to Hamburg, the Gestapo opened it up, they auctioned off all our property. Not only that, we had had to pay again everything which we had originally paid for the items in that container. Whether it was something large like a bed or a cupboard, or whether it was just a teaspoon or a salt Everything had to be paid for again, and I remember my father spending nights typing over 30 pages, some of which we still have. So we never saw that again. So now we packed our bags. We were taking two cases, one hand luggage, and my father's attache case. And I remember still very well George and me standing on Bahnhof Sur, waiting for the train to arrive.
our grandmother came, yes. Yes. And we were supposed to leave on a Wednesday. And as George reminds me, on the Saturday before that Wednesday, and we're now just one week before the war started, although we didn't know it, our grandmother came very early in the morning. My parents were rather upset because one doesn't usually visit at that time of day. And she said she'd been listening illegally to the radio. We'd had to give up on our radios. All our things like even our tricycles we'd had to give up. But the radio was another thing which we weren't allowed to keep. She said she'd been listening illegally to the radio and she thought that war was imminent. My parents' first reaction was, yes, it does seem as if war will start soon, but we're leaving on Wednesday. She told us, don't leave on Wednesday, leave today still. Forget about the tickets you've got to go by boat to Hamburg and then to London and then wait in England to go on to America. Forget about all that. Leave tonight or tomorrow. Well, this was a Saturday morning. Fortunately, my parents were persuaded. My mother persuaded my father. Now he had to buy tickets to go by train, but we'd given up all our money. And he went back to that same caretaker, the father of those two boys we were no longer allowed to play with. We begged him, please, could you lend us some money? And he did. He was one of the lights. He was good to us. He lent us the money, and without that money, we could not have got out. Of course, we paid him back after the war. We even sent him food parcels when we had hardly anything to eat. But we were very grateful because he had saved our lives by lending us that money. Now, as I said earlier, we were on the station Bahnhof Zoo in Berlin. The train arrived. Everyone squeezed onto the train. There was one person to see us off. She was the niece of my mother. She had permission to come to England. She'd been married for a few weeks only. The husband had gone ahead. He happened to have his own passport. One of the things which saved us is we had one passport between the four of us. If it hadn't been for the fact that we had one passport between the four of us, our father would also possibly have gone ahead to prepare the way. Here you see the passport with a big red J on it. So we said to her, look, we know you've got permission to go to England to be a, a children's nurse. Your husband is waiting for you. He's going to be a gardener. Come with us. But she didn't. She said, I'm sorry, I can't come with you. I've got to pick up two dresses from the dressmaker. But I'm leaving tomorrow, Sunday at 12 o'clock. She couldn't be persuaded. Yes, the next day she left that same station. She got as far as Bentheim on the border between Germany and England. She was sent back. She was sent to a work camp and she died as a result of ill treatment and overwork. She never made it because of two stupid dresses. The husband used to come and die on our, cry on our shoulder during the war. He'd lost his wife. He never got married again. His life was totally destroyed and her life was lost as a result. We were on the train and you'd think, ah, well now at least freedom at last, but not quite, not quite the end of the story. We got to Bentheim on the border and there we were told just to show our documents to leave the luggage on the train where it would be inspected. We got off the train, my father with his attaché case and just with our hand luggage. As soon as we got off, that train, which was supposed to take us right through Germany to Hook of Holland, it was a transcontinental express, was shunted back into Germany. And here we were on the border and we had to wait 24 hours on the cold floor there, surrounded by Germans, by German soldiers. We didn't realize how precarious our position then was. My parents, he must have been in, in a terrible frame of mind. 
what George and I remember is we were hungry, we were thirsty, and if we needed to go to the toilet, we had to be accompanied by a soldier to go to the toilet. But fortunately, it was a Dutch train which arrived, otherwise we might well have had to go back into Germany ourselves. It was a Dutch local train, and so we went through Holland, where we stopped four times to change trains. Some of the Dutch people took pity on us and gave us chocolates and sweets. But then we reached Hook of Holland. From Hook of Holland, in a very crowded boat, we reached Harwich. From Harwich, the train to Liverpool Street Station. And we got off at Liverpool Street Station, the four of us. No one was expecting us. We had no language. We had hardly any money, only a few pounds which we were allowed by the Germans to take because they realised there would be a passage then on to America. Just the clothes we were standing in, the hand luggage and my father's case. But I did have one thing with me because I carried it all the way through that fateful journey. And that was it. My little teddy bear. It's the only thing I have from the first six and a half years of my life. And now I'm going to pass over to George to tell you about what happened to us as war broke out only four days after we arrived. We arrived on the 27th of 27th August. of August and on the 1st of September war broke out. So over to George. Here we are, Liverpool Street Station, not knowing what to do, just standing there and wondering what next, because we were not expected, of course. Well, fortunately, a charity called the Central British Fund for Jewish Refugees um, came to find us and asked whether we needed help. Well, of course we did. We were in a, a desperate situation. And they said, well, we can help. We'll organize everything for you. And they arranged for us to go to, into a hotel, the Russell Square Hotel, and booked us there for seven nights. So this is how we managed to start life in England. We were not certain that uh, food would be included. So we were especially careful, and I still remember this with our parents, not to eat too much. And also, uh, when my mother went out to do a little bit of shopping for the first time, all she could afford was some additional carrots, which she could then prepare for us as extra food, little knowing that, in fact, uh, the charity itself was actually paying for us. We were obviously uh, in complete uh, problem for, at that stage, not knowing where we were and what to do. And one incident I particularly remember where Peter and I um, were left alone one day and feeling rather hungry, decided to try by pushing the button there. Well, the uh, girl who came in there, the uh, uh, maid, uh, didn't know what we wanted. We, of course, spoke only German at that time. So by pointing to our mouths and to our stomach, we showed that we were hungry. So uh, she realized what we needed, but not only she came back, but a whole host of other maids who were working there because they found it very interesting to see all of a sudden identical twins there. So this was one of the first incidents that uh, I can remember of our life in England. The other problem, of course, was that uh, we needed some money to um, cover the extra costs of staying in, uh, in London or in England for a while. Luckily, my mother had two sisters who, uh, in the 1930s, managed to get away from Berlin and uh, were uh, allowed to go into what was then called Palestine and is Israel now. And we sent a telegram to them and within a few days, they were able to send some money across to England, which we, was then made available to us so that at least we had some money to spend for either accommodation or any of our needs. 
So seven days after we arrived, we then went to, uh, for the first time, to a single room. And in fact, for the first four years that we stayed in England, um, we were always in one room for the four of us, because to the beginning, at the beginning, that was all we could afford. Well, um, we went to Chiswick, which is near Turnham Green, um, and uh, found a single room there. And we're very fortunate because across from where we were living, there was a private school where the headmistress heard about two young uh, Jewish refugees that had arrived. And she uh, told us by coming across that she would be happy for us to join the school free of charge so that we could learn some English. And in fact, uh, we both went over to that school and within a very short time, we were already able to communicate in English. And in fact, we still have in our possession uh, a uh, report from that first few months that we had there um, uh, telling us, telling that uh, our English already was well spoken. The first thing that we were obtained from the uh, British government um, were um, some um, uh, gas, gas masks. masks. And uh, special gas masks at that time were being allocated to children. So I had a, a Mickey Mouse and Peter had a, a Donald Duck uh, passport. Um, gas mask. Uh, uh, gas mask. Uh, a gas mask, uh, which enabled people to tell us apart. Well, now, um, life at that time was fairly reasonable, but still very expensive. And we were told that if we were to leave London and go to somewhere else outside London, life would be cheaper. And in particular, we had the idea recommended to us of going to Eastbourne in Sussex. Well, we decided to go there, found a room for ourselves, very near to the beach. And that certainly appealed to both Peter and I, because we thought, well, that's uh, much better than uh, uh, being uh, away from uh, the sea. But when we arrived, we found to our consternation uh, that no one was allowed on the beach anymore, because uh, there was barbed wire everywhere. Uh, the, at that time, the war had started, and the uh, uh, worry was that uh, Britain would be invaded at any moment, so that even uh, staying in Eastbourne uh, wasn't all as uh, special or enjoyable as we had expected. Well, by the time um, uh, the middle of the uh, year came and uh, we had um, Whitson, my mother decided for the first time to bake some cake for us. We were looking forward to this, and it was a Sunday, Whitson, um, at around 11 o'clock, there was a knock on the door. We were right close to the beach at the time, and we thought, well, someone was just coming to say hello to us. Uh, but it wasn't. Two um, uh, policemen came, uh, not in uniform, two uh, policemen came to take our father away. This was the first of internment, where any Jews who were living anywhere near uh, any of the beaches were near the sea were being interned as a uh, proof that uh, they wouldn't be able to act as spies. The point, of course, at the time was that probably among those Germans who were still living in England, there would be some spies at the time. Uh, but at, the, uh, at that particular moment, uh, Churchill decided uh, in his wisdom, that it's best to have everyone interned, and within a very short space of time, more than 40,000 people were sent to the Isle of Man, and our father was among those. When uh, this happened, our mother thought, well, uh, I'll immediately go to the police and see whether I can't be arrested as well, um, can't go, can't be with, our, with the uh, uh, dad, and she went there with both of us, but they refused, but at least my mother then saw that among the others who were being arrested were some of the people we knew who were also German refugees uh, being arrested for the same reason, 
and that uh, at least uh, meant that she was not quite so worried anymore. At, at the same time, she was told, uh, you have to leave within five days, which we did. So we moved to England, to, uh, to London, and we got accommodation in, um, in, in uh, Camden Town, again in one room, just in time for the start of the Blitz. Well, probably some of you will have heard about the Blitz. Uh, it's when the Germans sent over the uh, bombers every night, uh, particularly to London, to uh, uh, bomb all the areas. And with, within a short space of time, um, uh, our mother, who was alone, of course, by then, decided that the best way to save the situation would be to spend every night in shelter uh, in uh, the underground. And we found space in Tottenham Court Road underground and sent a message to our father to tell him spending um, nights Tottenham Court Road underground, platforms three and four Northern Line. And we still have a copy of that, which in fact uh, we have handed to the, uh, uh, the museum in uh, Berlin. This was uh, in case my, our father was being released at any time. We were still hoping, of course, uh, at that stage uh, to, um, uh, that, that we might get to uh, States. Uh, the, the other advantage for my parents and for my mother was that um, uh, we were actually in Tottenham Court Road, which was near to the main office of the Central Bureau. And uh, we went there on quite a few occasions every week to see whether we could get uh, um, a uh, crossing to uh, America. And uh, the Central Bureau, realizing how short of money we were, um, were very helpful and gave us a little bit of money each time we went there uh, to help just uh, what, what was needed. Uh, our father was eventually released after about five or six months in, uh, in internment. The situation became better uh, because the uh, Blitz uh, finished when the uh, British won uh, the air uh, uh, against the air attacks. Uh, and uh, what happened next was that uh, our parents started work. We were still living in one room for a while, but it wasn't so long uh, before we also managed to get a two-room flat. My mother worked as a dressmaker. My father, in his first job, became timekeeper in uh, a uh, demolition firm. So this is how we started work. We, Peter and I managed to um, uh, get into a school and uh, later to a, a grammar school when we were 11 years old. And in 1945, we were delighted when uh, the war was over and Britain had won the war. And you may well be seeing a copy of the photograph taken where Peter and I uh, were proud of this fact uh, with our uh, Union Jacks showing and uh, took, photographs were taken of us outside where we were living. In uh, 1948, um, we uh, decided to become British. And this was, again, a big occasion for both Peter and I because we were naturalized British and could really feel that we were living as British citizens. Well, I'm now going to hand over to my brother to continue. We were now quite happily living in England. We got over the worst. You may wonder, why didn't we get to America? Well, the reason is quite simple. Although my mother went there and begged them to send us over, it was already too dangerous because the Nazis were bombing and torpedoing ships crossing the Atlantic. And that's why, at the last moment, our ship was cancelled. So when my father was released, thinking he would join us and that we would then go to Liverpool and sail to America, that never happened. So we never got to America at that stage. But never mind, we were in England. All right, we had lost everything, but we had gained our freedom. And we were living in a democratic country, and on the whole we were well received. Yes, George and I had certain difficulties because of our language and also because 
we were thought of initially as Germans. We couldn't hide the fact. Even then we spoke with accents and so on. And I remember there was one school where my mother was actually attacked to some extent and had to drag us out and get away from that school. But fortunately, we then went to a much better school where we did well. We worked very hard. We went to a grammar school called William Ellis in Highgate, and there we prospered. We did very well. We had a very supportive headmaster. And as a result, both of us won scholarships to go to Oxford for three years. Isn't it wonderful to think that here, having arrived as penniless refugees, we're being paid by the government to study and live for three years at Oxford at the total expense of the state. Which other country can offer something like that? It's much more difficult for students nowadays, as we know, but at that time we were fortunate. But before we went to university at Oxford and studied law, both of us, we thought it was only right that we should, like all other young people at the time, to our national service. So in September 1962, we went into the army. 52. 1952, thank you, yes. Seems a long time ago now. And in 1952, we went into the army and then we were actually on active service because at that time there were problems in Egypt. Naguib was trying to get the British out of the canal zone. So we were sent out there and we were on active service for a few months, as a result of which both George and I were awarded the uh, um, General Service Medal, of which we're very proud. So now, here we were both studied. I decided to continue and for three years studied further in order to qualify as a solicitor. My brother became a vocational guidance psychologist. So we both had good jobs. And we're very happy now living in England, although it's been so difficult financially, especially as my parents initially weren't even allowed to work because the permission to come to England for the short period was on the basis that neither of them would work or take on any employment. And that is why we really needed the help of charity. It's now the uh, World Relief. Jewish Relief. That's the name now for that charity. They really helped us. And so, after that help, and because my parents worked hard, we were settled in England and were pleased to be here. Both of us have had now good lives. Um, both of us are married. I'm married to Marianne. George is married to Marion. My wife, Marianne, accompanies me now because both of us, in these last 10 years or so, have been going around to schools universities, colleges, and other institutions talking about our past. Marianne has got her own story to tell. Both of us have won the British Empire Medal as a result. So we feel that we've done something useful and are still doing something useful now. Because when one thinks about it, it's important for people to know what happened. There's still people in this country and in the world generally who don't even believe that the Holocaust happened. There are others, many of them, who say, deny the actual horrors which were committed by the Germans. But we know this was so. We know that after the Nazis captured Europe, they were then going into all the countries, killing, first of all, by shooting, and later on, by massacre. But then we also feel that we have a duty to mention, especially when we go to schools, that people have a choice. And that is what the theme of Holocaust Memorial Day actually says. To have light in darkness. They have a choice. Everyone has a choice as to whether to be good or bad. Auschwitz, the Holocaust, did not begin with gas chambers. It ended with that. It began with indifference. People were indifferent. Nothing to do with me. Why should I worry? Gradually, things got worse. After indifference, you had physical attack. You had bullying. And gradually, only gradually, 
of the shooting didn't even come to gas chambers, where thousands were being killed in one day just because they happened to be Jewish. We're all alike. We know that. The horrible pandemic which we're now going through, that doesn't just hit one section of the community, it hits all of us. It's a world problem. Racism is a world problem. We mustn't forget that. We must all strive to be better people. This fight isn't just against one section, like the blacks or the Jews. Hitler wasn't just against the Jews. He was against everyone who opposed him. He wanted to have world domination. It so easily could happen again, unless we're aware of it. We have to be the shining light, even when there is darkness. Thank you all for listening. I hope that we have made an impact. If we have, then we've done our duty. Thank you very much for listening and for being part of this event of Holocaust Memorial Day. Mm -hmm.